After the gruesome murder of Mary Ann Nichols, there was a great amount of fear amongst the women of Whitechapel. But you may also be surprised to hear that there was a great amount of excitement as well. People would gather from afar to view the place of death of Mary Ann Nichols, and many were coming up with their own theories of who could have carried out such a gruesome crime. You could say these were the very first Ripperologists. There was a sense of danger and attraction to the area, and people loved to speculate on who could have done it, when in fact the police already had a suspect. After questioning the women of Whitechapel, they noticed the same description of a man seemed to be presented to them on more than one occasion, a man who terrified the prostitutes of Whitechapel. Apparently, he would demand money from the prostitutes, and if they didn't pay, he would beat them severely and take the money anyway. Some said he would dish out the beatings regardless, and the name they gave him actually sounded like a name taken straight from a Penny Dreadful book. They called him Leather Apron, due to his choice of attire, which was always a long, dirty leather apron. Although the police had this information, it was still pretty vague, and at first they didn't really have a real name to go with this sinister character that was created by the women of Whitechapel. That is until one Sunday on the 2nd of September when a police officer who was on duty in Church Street, Spitalfields, was approached by a woman who instantly started pointing out a man in the street and insisted that the man was no other than Leather Apron. After some hesitation, the police officer ran up to the man and proceeded to question him. The man insisted that the woman held some kind of hatred towards him and that she would try anything to get him in trouble. However, the woman insisted that she was telling the truth and even offered to fetch two more women who had seen this man that they had named Leather Apron on the night of Murray Ann Nichols' death. But, to her surprise, the police officer declined her offer and simply let the man go. However, this didn't stop the newspapers from taking this information and running their own investigations, which were more than likely fabricated and creating some pretty damaging headlines, such as this one, which is regarded as the story that led to some racism in the area due to the mention of the Jewish community, who at this time were already hated. I'm about to read you an extract that I've chosen from one of these articles that give you a little bit of an insight as to what were going through the people's minds Back in the 1800s, when Jack the Ripper was stalking the streets of Whitechapel, you'll notice that they give quite a quite a exaggerated fictional description of Leather Apron. But what you will also notice is the relentless racism towards the Jewish community, which they couldn't help but include into this article. His expression is sinister and seems to be full of terror for the women who describe it. His eyes are small and glittering. His lips are usually parted in a grin, which is not only not reassuring, but excessively repellent. He is a slipper maker by trade, but does not work. His business is blackmailing women late at night. A number of men in Whitechapel follow this interesting profession. He has never cut anybody so far, but always carries a leather knife, presumably as sharp as leather knives are wont to be. This knife, a number of the women have seen. His name nobody knows but are all united in the belief that he is a Jew or of Jewish parentage, his face being of a marked Hebrew type. But the most singular characteristic of the man, and one which tends to identify him closely with last Friday night's work, is the universal statement that in moving about he never makes any noise. What he wears on his feet, the women do not know, but they all agree that he moves noiselessly. His uncanny peculiarity to them is that they never see him or know of his presence until he is close by them. And that was from The Star, which was published on the Wednesday, the 5th of September, 1888. Now, it's important to mention that at this time in London, it was becoming increasingly hard to find work in any profession to the Jewish immigrants fleeing persecution and coming to England, and basically taking work for much, much less pay than the British workforce. And they were accused of making jobs obsolete, so the relationship between the British and the Jewish communities was strained to say the least and any excuse to use them as some kind of scapegoat was not unusual. There was even an abusive name that was cruelly used to describe the Jewish people at the time and that name was Lipsky, which was introduced so harshly after a gruesome murder way back in 1887 where a Jewish man named Israel Lipsky had poisoned his female neighbour by pouring nitric acid down her throat. And although both the murderer and the victim were Jewish, it didn't seem to matter and it was just another way to stereotype all Jewish people as inhumane and untrustworthy. And by 1888, the nickname 
Lipsky had now been associated with every Jew as a way of the ultimate insult, being named after a monster. After a bit of investigations from the police and following many leads, the character of Leather Apron was identified to be that of a Mr. John Pizer, but unfortunately, he had gone into hiding after hearing that the police were looking for him. You see, John Pizer was actually the man who was questioned on Church Street and then let go, and this may have either scared the man or he did indeed have something to hide. And for now, the police had no idea of his whereabouts. Eventually, they would find John Pizer, but not before what is believed to be Jack the Ripper's second victim was found in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street on the 8th of September 1888. Her name was Annie Chapman. Annie was born in September 1841 and she was the first of five children born to George Smith and Ruth Chapman. George Smith had a career in the army as a lifeguard and this meant that Annie's early years saw her family moving around now and again going wherever her father's military life took them. Apparently Annie developed a weakness for alcohol from quite an early age. Despite her family trying to persuade her not to drink, it didn't really do any good. The family moved around quite a lot and the family became split at some point due to Annie getting employment as a servant in London whilst her father moved the rest of the family down to a parish in Clewer. On the 13th of June 1863, while staying at a public house called the Elephant and Castle, George Smith and his father took his own life by cutting his own throat. On the 1st of May 1869, Annie married John James Chapman, who was related to her mother, and it wasn't long before Annie had a little family comprising of three children, Emily, Ruth, Annie, Georgina and John Alfred. Unfortunately, John was born a cripple and was eventually placed in a care home. It is believed at this point in Annie's life she had started to resist the urge to drink alcohol, probably due to her sick child needing all of her attention. Although this didn't last too long, due to the death of Annie's 12-year-old daughter, Ruth, who died of meningitis in 1882 and it was probably responsible for both Annie and John turning back to alcohol, and they were apparently arrested on many occasions for being drunk in public. In 1885, Annie and her husband came to a mutual agreement to separate and go their separate ways, and the husband took custody of the remaining child. Annie spent a while living in and out of workhouses until she did, however, find brief happiness with a man whose business was making wire sieves. Annie's husband provided her with a weekly allowance of 10 shillings a week until his death in 1886, so of course the payments came to an abrupt end, but Annie had no idea that her husband had passed until she was informed by her brother, and apparently her own surviving daughter may have travelled around in France with a circus. Now, possibly due to the money from her husband coming to an end, Annie's new love interest decided to leave her. It is thought he was only interested in the money, that she received each week. In the month of May 1888, Chapman stayed at Crossingham's lodging house at 35 Dorset Street, paying 8p a night for a double bed which he shared in the week with a pensioner. Apparently, it was said that Annie Chapman was looking more and more unhappy and depressed, but also physically ill and pale, and had even spent some time in hospital for a while until she was released on the 7th of September, the day before her murder. On the 8th of September, just after midnight, Annie Chapman was refused a bed from the lodging house deputy, Timothy Donovan, because she didn't have the right money. Soon after drinking a pint of beer and then eating a jacket potato, she ventured out onto the streets to gain money for a bed for the night by means of prostitution. At around 5.30am, Annie was seen by a Mrs Elizabeth Long, just beyond the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. She was seen talking to a gentleman possibly in his 40s. He had dark hair and had a foreign, shabby, genteel appearance. He was wearing a brown, low-collared felt hat and possibly a dark coat. Apparently, the man was heard asking Annie, Will you? And she replied, Yes. Mrs Elizabeth Long was sure that the lady she had seen was Annie Chapman and she was also sure that the time was 5.30am due to the chime of a nearby clock. If this is true then it is entirely possible that she was the last person to see Annie Chapman alive. 
Now, if we go back just half an hour at around 5am, John Richardson, the son of a resident of 29 Hamborough Street, came out into the backyard to check if the cellar door was safe and secure, and then he sat on the rear steps of the property to trim some leather from his boots. He noticed absolutely nothing. Nothing suspicious at all. However, at around 5.15am, Albert Kadosh, neighbour of 29 Hamborough Street, ventured out into the dark backyard to use the outdoor toilet, and apparently he heard a bit of commotion on the opposite side of the fence. He heard a woman say, no, no, before hearing what sounded like something falling against the fence that separated the two properties. This must have been a regular or unsurprising thing to happen around those parts because he decided not to investigate and just go on about his business. Little did he know, at the time, he had probably heard Annie's last words as she was pleading with the killer. On the morning of the 8th of September 1888, shortly before 6am, Mr John Davis, an elderly man who lived at 29 Hanborough Street, came down the dark passageway of his property and headed towards the back door, which led out into the backyard, where the outside toilet was situated. As he stepped out into the yard, he was met with a most unpleasant sight that made him gasp and stumble backwards. He then made for the front of the property to try and yell for assistance. Luckily, at that exact moment, two men making their way to work were passing by and had been surprised by the elderly man who came running up to them, shouting. He shouted, men, come here. The three men followed the older gentleman back into the yard to find a site that would forever take up a permanent home in their memories. Lying just there, outside the back door, in between the fence and the steps of the property, was a mutilated body of Annie Chapman. Annie was completely covered in blood. Her hands lay towards the upper part of her body, her bloody palms turned outwards as if she fought for her life until the very end. Her head lay turned upwards towards the house, and her clothing was pulled up above her waist, and the violence that had been inflicted was a lot worse than the first murder. She had literally been gutted. Just like Marianne Nichols, Annie had her throat cut so deep that the knife reached the backbone of her neck. Annie had also been disemboweled and her intestines had been draped over her right shoulder, whilst over her left shoulder lay cuts of meat from her stomach and flesh. Her tongue was swollen and protruding from her mouth and she wore a handkerchief around her neck which was used to strangle her before the deep cut was made to her throat. The three men ran from the yard to find a police officer, although one of the gentlemen who went by the name of James Kent gave up his search and instead went in search of a stiff drink to calm his nerves. It was Henry Holland who found a police officer first, but was shocked to find that the police officer would refuse to budge from his fixed post and instructed Henry to go and find the police station. In the meantime, John Davis had done just that and had informed the police of his gruesome discovery. It was not long before an Inspector Chandler arrived at the scene of the crime, which was already becoming overrun with members of the public, and so more reinforcements were needed to keep the crowds away and also contained for questioning. Whilst the crowds were being moved away from the scene, Inspector Chandler found some material to cover up the body until the surgeon arrived. At 6.30am the surgeon arrived, a Dr Phillips, and it didn't take him long to establish that the woman was dead. She was so badly mutilated, there was no question about it. When the body was moved to the mortuary, the examination showed that parts of Annie's uterus and bladder had been removed and taken by the killer, which suggested the killer may have had surgical skills. Although it is believed that it is possible that the uterus and the bladder was removed by members of the morgue to sell on to medical research, as this was not uncommon at the time. There was also talk of an American man, an American doctor, who had been asking around for any surgical specimens, and he had been placed as a suspect, but not for long, as it was discovered that the American doctor had been out of the country for over a year now. But there was also another suspect. You see, in that very same garden, where Annie lay dead, was an apron sitting out under the garden tap. But it wasn't any apron. It was a leather apron. However, the apron actually belonged to a Mr. John Richardson and was placed there in the yard by his mother after she had washed the apron days before. But this piece of factual information didn't matter to the newspapers. After all, the penny dreadful image that had been built up around a sinister man named Leather Apron was selling newspapers. So why not report that an apron made from leather had been found in Hanbury Street and speculate that it belonged to the same man 
who was known by many prostitutes as Lever Apron. As we have now established, Lever Apron was a gentleman named John Pizer, who was a Jewish shoemaker, and apparently he made footwear from leather, so that must be where the name came from. Like I said before, John Pizer had heard the rumours that the police were looking for him and had gone into hiding. Due to Lever Apron being at large still, the streets of Whitechapel were not safe. But this wasn't because there was a killer on the loose, this was because the general public had decided to form mobs to try and find the killer, which meant that a lot of innocent people were now at risk of being hurt or worse, especially innocent Jewish people, who were now enemy number one and looked upon with more hatred than before. However, it wouldn't be long before the police found John Pizer and took him into custody and apparently he went with no fuss whatsoever and the police questioned him thoroughly. Meanwhile, there were lots of people coming forward claiming that John Pizer was in fact the person they knew as Leather Apron and the stories of violence that he inflicted were apparently well known to all. Apart from John Pizer, that is, Leather Apron himself, who apparently had no idea of the nickname he had been given and denied the accusations of violence and especially the murder of Annie Chapman. In fact, the only act of violence that could be proven was an attack on another man who had been stabbed in the past but it would seem the accusations of threatening prostitutes was just a rumour and could not be proven. Although the arresting police officer did claim that he knew John Pizer for quite some time and he had no doubt that this was a man known as Leather Apron. A full search of John Pizer's house went ahead which found no evidence at all. There were five knives found in John Pizer's apartment and the police believed that they made a breakthrough when they found what they believed to be dried up blood on the blades but this was later revealed to be only rust. The murder of Annie Chapman could not be pinned to John Pizer. It would seem that he had an airtight alibi. At the time of the second murder, he was with family members, and at the time of the first murder, he was watching the dock fires that burned on that very night, and then he returned to his lodging house as Polly, the first victim, would have fallen under the blade of the mysterious figure that stalked the maze of the streets of Whitechapel and lurked in the shadows. It would seem that the killer was still on the loose and no one knew when or where he would strike next or who would be his next victim but it would only be a total of 22 days before a lady named Elizabeth Stride would become the third victim of the man we now call Jack the Ripper.